I'm um, Professor Tang for the invitation. Thank you very much, the previous keynote speaker, for being very inspirational. I got me um, thinking about how important it is that we are aware of what the consequences are if we are measuring public behavior. And that's basically the topic of my last 14 years of research. I started a long time ago, um, 1991, at MIT. And as Professor Tang said, at that time, I was indeed a postdoc at the Lab for Computer Science at MIT. And I had no clue at that time that the world would change so much based on the internet. But um, under the title of From the Emperors to Empathy, I would like to put light to some of the changes that the internet brought to society, that's one thing. And the other thing, some of the changes that we are going to impact on society by measuring and modeling public behavior. If you look at the proceedings of this conference, we see a lot of social or collective behavior modeling. And once people know that, they will change their behavior. To give a very shocking example, we, we are all familiar with the terrorists, with the ISIS terrorists, and CIA and other agencies are trying to model that behavior. Well, if the terrorists are aware that they are being modeled, they will change their behavior. And the same, um, we see that with stock modeling, where occasionally we get about Black Fridays, where the automated trading systems are fighting against each other, and then that leads to such chaotic consequences that they have to turn down, to turn off the stock exchange. And that's indeed what, um, when we do social impact, large scale modeling, we might also get. So um, what are we doing in our own group? We are not building terracotta soldiers as um, 200 years ago, but we are trying to predict what's going to happen tomorrow. And we do that either by looking at the inside. And in the old days, if a general or an emperor wanted to know whether they would go to war, they would assume that if they looked at the intestines of a chicken, that would tell them whether they would win the battle. And if the chicken intestines weren't telling the story, they would look at the stars and would try to predict whether they are going to win the battle. Which is quite preposterous that a few humans on the world <laughs> jump from the way how the stars, the constellation changes, assuming that they are so important. I find that also quite uh, a big, uh, quite uh, somewhat arrogant. So nevertheless, today we don't need chickens anymore and we don't have a look at the star. But we look at Twitter data or any other microblogging data. What you see here is a Twitter network. And then we are trying to predict what's going to happen. And in our own work, together with Sandy Pentland from the MIT Media Lab, we have started using the sociometric badges, which are devices just like the conference badge. You wear them around your neck, and they measure your speech energy through the accelerometer. They measure whether you look into each other's eyes through infrared sensors. They measure how close you are to each other with Bluetooth sensors. And they measure speech energy through microphones. And they also measure whether I speak or other people speak, because the more turn taking you get, the better it is for the quality of the group interaction. And that's really what brings me from the emperor, because we used to have one single person, the emperor, deciding what's going to happen. Today, we measure empathy. We measure, try to measure very soft things. And I'm wearing here a smartwatch. And probably quite a few are wearing smartwatches. A few are wearing smartwatches, too. We don't need the sensors anymore, the batches because we have to sensor on our body if you wear a smartwatch. So this might look like a Pebble smartwatch. You could also take an iWatch. 
but I call that the happy meter because using some random forest machine learning model which is running in Germany for this particular thing he told me yesterday that I'm not happy anymore because I had been flying for 30 hours from Boston to Zurich then waiting there for 6 hours and then fly another 10.5 hours and fly here and then I, I was really jet lagged I was really tired. The system told me so. I was in this aquatic center and walking around. And then I said, OK, the system tells me I'm stressed and unhappy. I go back. And I sleep for 14 hours or 12 hours. And that worked. And now I'm awake and relatively fit again. So um, this sort of um, measuring individual behavior can also be applied to measuring collective behavior and we have done work with the sociometric batches for creative teams. And we have started working with the happy meter, actually that short class that Professor Tang was mentioning at um, Chinese Academy of Science Summer School. We were experimenting with the happy meters, with the smartwatches. And I could predict, and I was actually showing in real time how happy the students were with my class. So if I was too confusing in what I was saying, so you can see the curve. And you can measure that based on the happy meter watch has um, fewer sensor, sweeter sensors than the sociometric batch that you see here. But still, it measures um, the energy through um, the accelerometer. It also um, has a light sensor, so it sees how bright it is. It has a speech sensor because you can basically dictate um, SMS and so on. And it, of course, has location through GPS, which is not very accurate. But then you can take the same things that um, my, um, was mentioned in the talk just before, like the weather forecast. Because what we found, for example, happiness and weather are strongly correlated in the course at Chinese Academy of Sciences, um, I saw that when the weather was getting cooler because it was very hot and humid last July in Beijing, and when it got cooler and was raining, the students were happier. Our average happiness went up, and they also claimed that they would understand better what I was saying. But the bottom line is, external variables like the weather forecast have quite a strong influence on our behavior. And the thing that makes the difference is that we are now all connected. That means I don't have the happy meter, and you have a happy meter, and you measure the same thing with your um, smartphone, because that's also a sensor system. It's not a, as good a sensor system as the smartwatch, because, for example, right now, my smartphone is on the table. So I wouldn't measure that I'm a little bit stressed, a bit nervous, because I'm standing here. But this um, happy meter will measure it. It will transmit it to the um, server in Germany. We are using a server in Germany because we are doing a lot of projects also with Europeans. And they don't want, as you know, privacy is very strong in um, Europe. So we cannot have a server in the US. So we have to have a server in Germany to get all of this data um, aggregated. And then we can measure um, uh, some collective um, patterns of happiness, of collaboration quality, and so on. And so collective consciousness. That means, in a sense, we wouldn't really need Mr. Trump. We wouldn't need any politicians. Because if that system were perfect, we could just have an automated system that would take our inputs and make the decisions. Well, I think in that regard, we are not yet in the age of empathy but still in the age of emperors, because at least in the US, but also in China, we have Jack Ma. And Jack Ma makes the decisions because he decides what Alibaba is doing. And in the US, you have Jeff Bezos, you have those guys here. I mean, those faces are really known in Europe. And I think they really rule the country to some extent, like uh, Larry Page from Google, like Mark Zuckerberg from Facebook, like um, um, Apple, like Amazon, like Microsoft, they are called the Frightful Five. And 
they, they decide a lot. And the question is, what can we as individuals do to um, be as effective as they are? So what, what are they doing that sets them apart? And I have studied that behavior, and I will share some of my lessons learned. Also for back to my time when I was a young postdoc coming from Switzerland at the it was called LCS at that time, Lab for Computer Science at MIT, observing people like Tim Berners-Lee, the founder of the web, Linus Torvalds, founder of Linux, and so on, and what's, what's the difference? And I think one of the key differences is that they understand collective intelligence. They understand what the impact of their actions is on large groups of people. And I think in the age of emperors, and this year is an um, example from Sweden, this is the king of Sweden in the age when there was a big war and, uh, in 1600. And he was extremely successful. His name is Gustav Adolphus. He won all his battles because he was leading the charge in the front. He wasn't afraid. He was winning the battles until he was hit by a bullet. And then um, that came to an end. So not being afraid, not being people being at the front and leading the charge is certainly a very important characteristic. And if you look at Steve Jobs or the current hero in the US is Elon Musk, the founder of Tesla. He's also right now sleeping on the roof of his factory because his car is having some production problems. So he is not afraid of leading and um, being not exposed. However, Gustav Adolphus in Sweden gives a great example of how not to be an emperor, because while he was very successful as a general, he was also ordering that ship here. And if you have ever been in <coughs> Stockholm, the capital of Sweden, you have gone to that museum because it's the, the biggest attraction in Sweden. This ship is called the Vasa, and it basically was sailing for 500 meters until a soft breeze came, and it was just blowing a little bit into the sails, and then the ship capsized, and only 30 people drank because the ship was still very close to the harbor, because this ship was built precisely to the specifications of the king. He wanted to have it more guns, and he wanted the ship to be higher than all the others, so it could shoot down. The ship is called the Vasa, and this is a great story of an emperor who knows everything, and asks everybody to take orders, and after this ship sunk, because it was not seaworthy, because the construction was so bad, because it was so high, that when the wind just blew a little bit from the side, it would capsize. They had an investigation by a royal commission, and the commission said, we don't really know what's going on because this ship has been exactly to the specifications of the king. So the only explanation is it must have been the will of God. That means if there is no other excuse anymore, it was just bad luck. And in this case, so, um, the emperor doesn't really get what he wants. And this is much different for Steve Jobs, who was a very creative leader, who was a very fearful leader, but who was also extremely good in getting others to buy into his ideas. And that's the big difference. If you look at uh, Jack Ma, if you look at Jeff Bezos, if you look at Larry Page and so on, it's a very different leadership style. It's not giving orders, but it's through empathy, having a certain level of humility, and convincing others that what you are doing is actually what gets the entire group much better off. And so what I would like to do in the rest of my presentation, I will cover those first five different things. First, I will talk about how we are getting 
our collective intelligence. And I do that through social quantum physics. In particular, one aspect which I call entanglement. And in a sense, entanglement is like the energy market. It's like this agent-based modeling example that we saw in the previous speech, where if you know that you're being messed, you change your behavior, and then that loop gets closer and closer. Then I will talk about some of our case studies where we have looked at entangled organizations that very measured social interaction on the global level with Twitter, on the organizational level, mining email archives, and on the individual level through sociometric badges and through the happy meter watches. And then I will introduce the main concept, which I coined some time ago, called coins. And coins is about everything but coin. It means it's not about money, but it's about collaboration. Coins mean collaborative innovation networks. And basically means if you are Jack Ma, if you are Larry Page and so on, Tim Berners-Lee, you will create your coins. How do you do that? By measuring and leveraging what I call honest signals of collaboration, a certain way of communicating because better communication, better collaboration, better innovation. And then you get your collective intelligence and you get Alibaba, where it is today. And then I will share with you some of the tools which you can download. We have a software tool called Condor and another one which is um, under development right now, which is called Transparency Engine, which allows you to measure that social quantum physics aspect. So let's start with entanglement, which um, not very humbly I have called social quantum physics this entire mechanism. It's basically two feedback loops. One is if you show empathy within your group, that will make your group entangled. And first, we can look at that on the interpersonal level, but once we have figured it out, we can, for example, just put a happy meter on each of you, one of those watches, like this one, and then we will see whether we are becoming an entangled group. Because the standard deviation of our energy levels will become small because our body language will get synced. If I start nodding like that and you start nodding like that, we are getting more entangled. And on the other hand, we also get this feedback loop, and we saw that for the power grid before. We also see that in the stock exchange, if you get your feedback, I call that the reflect and reboot cycle. Of course, I'm choosing words which are easy to remember. Empathy, entanglement, reflect, and reboot, which basically means that if you are, you don't know what sort of behavior will produce what outcome, you will change your behavior, which is like the Heisenberg effect. And that's why I'm calling this social quantum physics. Here I have a really nice example of entanglement. And this is A teacher in an inner city school, <coughs> and he's entangled with his students because he's developing an individual greeting for each student and he remembers all of them. So, what he's building is an entangled organization. That means if he would measure with the happy meter or the badges, they are reflecting each other's body signals, and this is a way of building face-to-face -face entanglement. And he has a really, he gives his classes in a very rough neighborhood, but they are getting top grades. Why? Because they feel respected. They feel taken seriously because he invests all that effort <laughs> for <laughs> inventing a personal ice cream. <laughs> for everybody. <laughs> so entanglement really works. And I will share now some projects of how we have measured entanglement. We started with the badges. And those badges, as I described, they have different sensors. You wear them around your neck. 
for example, <laughs> and when we started, that was still, um, we were the first ones that found this out, that your personality characteristics, and we are using something called the Big Five test, or also called Ocean, Openness, Experience, Conscientiousness, and so on. They are basically predicted through your body language. The way how I look at you would tell how neurotic I am. It will also tell whether I'm creative or not. It will also tell whether I'm introvert or an extrovert. It will also tell whether I'm predictable. This is called conscientiousness. So all of those characteristics can be extracted automatically. And if you put them together, we did some experiments with jazz musicians. We can measure, I call this group flow. You know there is negative stress, and there is positive stress. Positive stress is called early stress. And we can measure that group flow if some of the people are wearing those devices. And it doesn't need to be, everybody needs to have one, but if let's say four or five of you would be wearing the badges and you would see the curve here, then I would know whether I, I need to start juggling to get you more entertained or whether you are paying attention. In this case, you have the musicians. And what we found is that the more they are hopping around in zinc, the more their energy levels are in parallel, the slower the standard deviation, the happier the audience is. And we could measure that through the strength of the applause. So the, this sort of experiments, if you set them up wisely, you can very nicely combine independent and dependent variables. So your body actually mirrors a lot of it. And there were some, just the way how you look at me, in fact, even the way how your face is shaped will give away some of the things about you. There was um, some interesting papers recently uh, by um, a guy from Stanford who was looking at face shapes and sexual orientation. And he could predict just from the way how your face is shaped, whether you are gay or what, whatever interests you. So. I mean, the point is there is less and less privacy, less and less secrets. And I was thinking when I was reading that paper, you could basically take an augmented reality glasses, goggles, put them here, and then just looking at other people's faces, you would know what they think. So you would sort of can create automatic mind reading machines, not right into the brain, but I mean, now we are getting into very speculative areas, but we are doing a lot of this work. We are also using something called um, Muse, which is uh, a headband that we put around your, around the, um, the brain to measure bra alpha brain waves. And if you combine this information, there is basically less and less things you can keep secret. So that means we will get collectively intelligent whether we like it or not. And right now I'm struggling a lot learning Chinese. I tried for like five years and I'm still stuck at two words because it's such a different language from English or German or French or Italian or Spanish. I, I was born in Switzerland so we speak a lot of languages but they are all close together and Chinese just doesn't want to go into my brain. <laughs> but um, if we have these sort of devices and if you use the translation system, then I wouldn't actually need that anymore. <coughs> it, would, it would go automatically mediated through the computer. Anyway, right now we are measuring happiness. This year is the happy meter, the tool we are using right now with the Pebble Watch. You can also, we are porting it right now to other platforms like the iWatch, like um, the Garmin. There is also one from HTC, I think. The nice thing about those smartwatches is that you can use them to also collect dependent variables for your experiments because they have a little screen and you can ask the user questions. So this is how we train, for example, happiness. 
So we ask, how happy um, are you at the given point? And we uh, correlate that with the sensors. Then we use some smart machine learning. In our case, um, random forest works the best. We tried, we have very hard time with deep learning, but, but we couldn't figure it out. So um, this way you can basically predict who you are and you train it yourself. We have even put those smartwatches to animals <laughs> to see whether horse and rider, cat and owner, dog and owner are in sync. Now, obviously we cannot ask them how happy they are. But we know that the rider or the owner of an animal and how happy they are. So we have some insights. So the point is that we are getting more and more connected. And connectivity even goes across boundaries to different species. Anyway, this is the face-to-face -face connection part. The other part is the email connection part. And this here is a social network of a 70,000 people company where we are getting all their emails. It took me a very long time to get emails. I started working in that sort of analysis 15 years ago. And first we had to prove that you can actually gain real insights. And it took us five to 10 years to only be possible to get email archives. It took us another two, three years using sort of conventional techniques like um, regression and so on, that things work. And now with machine learnings, we are really, uh, machine learning methods, um, able, for example, to predict performance as measured through qualifications, to predict sales success measured through the sales numbers of individuals, customer satisfaction as measured through something called net promoter score, which is basically asking a customer how happy are you with the services of my company. And just by looking at email, we can get just as the happy meter gives me 80% accuracy, 80 to 85, we can get the same thing for a company. We get their email archive and we train the model, just like we had energy trading before in the first talk, we train the model with a few years past data, we extract the honest signals, and I will show you what those honest signals are, and those will be the input for our machine learning to predict the next few months of sales success, customer satisfaction, whether somebody is inclined to leaving the company, for example. So you can predict all of those things. This year is net promoter score, um, at the 70,000 people company where we looked at the top 700 managers and we also looked at the email communication of their entire um, people. They are an outsourcing company, so their um, employees work for like, 250 large companies. And we applied the social quantum physics process, meaning we told the employees of that company how happy their customers are and also how they are doing with regards to honest signals. And honest signals is, for example, are you using positive or negative language in your email? You can do that with machine learning. You train it and you get sentiment. How quickly are others responding to you? It's good if you answer, that you answer faster. So we take those variables. We tell the employees that how they are doing. We tell them what best practices are, how they should communicate, and what we have seen. In this case, we did an experiment over 14 months with the, with the employees. So out of 240 large accounts, in 24, they got virtual mirroring. It was a huge project. And we told them how they have been doing. And what we see here is that the companies, that's the blue bar, that got the treatment of being virtual mirrored, of getting that social quantum physics loop exposed and made obvious, their customers became 5% happier. 
Whereas at the same time, the other 200 accounts, their customers, they became 11.7% um, less happy. So what that shows is the Heisenberg principle of social quantum physics. If you measure a human system, if you tell what the measuring criteria are, people will change the behavior for the better. So I'm not sure Mr. Trump knows that. <laughs> but um, we also looked at global networks through Twitter. And um, we looked at fake news and how they spread um, on Twitter. And you can apply exactly the same honest signals to tweets. This here is the Twitter network about something called Pizzagate, which was something very stupid in the US. Um, right after the elections, um, one crazy guy tweeted a totally <coughs> unsubstantiated claim that Hillary Clinton was running a pedophile ring from the basement of a pizza restaurant just besides the White House. This was totally out of the blue and had zero correlation with reality. It was picked up by some conspiracy theorists. And what you see here is how it spreads out because you see the huge cluster of the people that believe that crazy, stupid idea. And you see the small cluster of people that say this is not true. This is ridiculous. This is totally made up. And then we applied our algorithms. And what you see, using our influencer algorithms, that the, and this measures again the honest signals, the speed of response, the emotionality of the tweets. And for example, it makes a person more influential if they, the entropy of the context is higher, if they are getting more new words, which you can very easily measure. And we measure how quickly those new words are being picked up by others. And that makes them influential. And what you see here is that the Pizzagate, the influential people tweeting about Pizzagate using new words are all in the center of the Donald Trump camp. And the Hillary Clinton group is totally influential and nowhere. So again, you get total transparency. And then now you can show that to Hillary and ask her whether she wants to have her, her people be tweeted in another way. I don't know whether that changes anything. But the point is that we can find those things very easily. Now, what we are trying to find, what we are trying to create, is coins or collaborative innovation networks. And to tell you the story about coins, I like to tell the story of Tim Berners-Lee, yeah. which um, is sort of a story from my own past. A very long time ago, 1991, I was just coming newly from the University of Zurich, where I had gotten my PhD, to MIT, where I was a uh, postdoc in the lab for computer science, uh, working in the advanced networking group on things like TCP IP, um, email, SMTP, and so on. Those things had all been um, invented by that group. Um, my boss was David Clark at that time. He was the head of the Internet Engineering Task Force. And I was working on new uses for that huge bandwidth, and nobody knew what to do. So I created something called CyberMap, which was sort of like an early web browser, but the web didn't exist at that time. But I wrote a paper about this CyberMap tool. It was accepted at the ACM Hypertext Conference, which is the top conference in that field, so I was really happy. I packed up my computer. I went to San Antonio in Texas. I presented my system. I was also having a table where on my computer I was demoing it. And then this man, Tim Berners-Lee, came to my table and asked me whether he could put up some flyers about a system called the World Wide Web on my table. Because he had also submitted a paper about his idea. His idea was called the World Wide Web to the ACM Hypertext Conference. Unfortunately, the program committee had thought his idea was too stupid, was too simple. It would never succeed. But he was not Gustav Adolphus. He was not an emperor. He was very humble. He was very empathic. So he just printed out a lot of papers. He printed out a lot of flyers. 
He packed his suitcase and he came to the ACM Hypertext conference and he went from one table to the other and asked people whether he could put up his papers on their table. The reason why he came to my table, it's called homophily, he had figured out that I was from Switzerland and he was also from Switzerland at that time. And he's British, but he was working at CERN in Geneva, so he was thinking that one Swiss person would help another Swiss person. And of course, I said, please feel welcome to put up your papers. He also tried to convince me to join his COIN, his Collaborative Innovation Network, his little group of intrinsically motivated people. And I had better things to do because I thought that system would never succeed and it had no scientific merit. But of course, um, there were some smarter people than me, so he recruited some students, initially not from MIT, but there were some from Japan, from Finland, from Dallas. And together they took his crazy idea, they took his prototype, they developed it further. Tim also convinced my boss, David Clark, to invite him as a visiting scientist. And I still remember in 1992, 93, when Tim came, he did not get an office. He only had a table in the hallway. He had a really old and clunky computer. And he was sending email to everybody and trying to recruit them to join his idea, his project. And he succeeded in convincing the boss of my boss, Michael Dertuzas, who was the director of the lab for computer science, to um, help him create the World Wide Web Consortium. <coughs> that's the bigger group, the COIN, the Collaborative Innovation Network. That's the small group of five to 15 people. They work together and they take crazy idea produce a prototype, they recruit their friends, and that's normally 150 plus minus. In this case, it was the World Wide Web Consortium that was big companies, and Tim was doing the smart thing because he used the prestige of MIT to reach out to those big companies. He used the connections of Michael Artusos to get to the CEOs and CIOs, and so they were able to get that into some big companies as a document sharing idea, and then there was another guy named Mark Andreessen who created a browser called Mosaic who made that system useful for everybody. And then, that's the interest network, they basically picked it up and it spread like wildfire. But this for me is the blueprint how all those crazy ideas, and whether they are called Alibaba, whether they are called Microsoft, and so on, they start with somebody who is not Gustav Adolphus, not the first Chinese emperor, but somebody who has empathy, somebody who, because they don't have the billions, they are not born as emperors, they don't have the armies, so they have to convince others. And then they get the coin, this little group, together they build a prototype, they recruit their friends and family, that's the 150, they will try it out, they are the testing ground, and they will tell their friends. And their friends, that's the rest of the world, that's the interest network, the rest is history. And the internet, which as you very well know, is not the web, IETF, Internet Engineering Task Force, World Wide Web Consortium, Linux, or Lego Mindstorms, which is programmable Lego bricks, but all the startups, they are all like coins, you can even write books. This is the Twilight Saga, which the author, Stephanie Meyer, co-wrote together with their with her um, uh, readers and then also end user innovations like snowboarding and mountain biking they are all products of coins transformative innovations disruptive innovations coins if you have incremental stepwise innovations that's what research labs of big companies can do they can make an existing smartphone better but they will not invent the next disruptive innovation. For that, you have to go outside. And the question now is, what can we learn from the Tim Berners-Lee's and so on? Linus Torvalds, Jimmy Wales, who created Wikipedia. And here I get very much inspired from the bees, because the bees, they're also collaborating and talking to each other without central leadership. Just as emergent systems, 
through coordinating from one bee to the other, they are building amazing large systems. And what looks chaotic from the outside is extremely well organized once you understand what is called the vagal dance of the bee, which is the bee language. And so what I'm trying to understand is not the vagal dance of the bee, but the vagal dance of Tim Berners-Lee. What did Tim Berners-Lee do different when he came to the hypertext conference in San Antonio? And for that, I use social network analysis. And the first thing is network structure, because Tim Berners-Lee connected to many different people. He went to the ASIM hypertext conference, and then he came to MIT. That means he was building his degree centrality, many friends, his between centrality, important friends, his closeness centrality, getting close to many influencers at the same time. So that's the first way of measuring honest signals. And if you wear a smartwatch and we measure your locations and how you interact, if we have the email archive, or if we get Twitter and Facebook and WeChat and so on, sadly we don't get WeChat because it's very centralized, it's easier to get, um, and Facebook is not so easy anymore, but <laughs> Twitter and Tina Weibo and Wikipedia and those sort of things we can get. And so for some things, we can predict their behavior very well. The second thing is static structure is good. Dynamic communication is much better for our insights. And for me, Tim Berners-Lee was the inspiration. When he came to MIT in 1993, if somebody sent an email in those times, you would read it, you would sleep over it, you would think about it, and you would answer it one week later. Well, that has changed a lot today. With the smartphones, you, t you tend to um, answer your WhatsApp or your WeChat messages three minutes later. Nevertheless, Tim Berners-Lee, in 1993, he already answered emails in five minutes. He was the only person I knew in 1993 who was like that. He was unbelievably passionate about his system. And the speed of response was a proxy for passion. And if Peter sends an email to Bill Gates or Jack Ma or Warren Buffett, who cares? Their email address is publicly known, and they probably will not answer me. But if Bill Gates answers my email five minutes after I sent it, I'm not Peter. I must be Barack Obama or Xi Jinping or some really important person. So the speed of response of somebody else is a proxy for respect. My speed of answering everybody is a proxy for passion. Either way, Speed of response, we call it average response time. That's a great honest signal. And the last one is based on the content. It's basically how positive and negative your messages are and how much a group of people starts developing their own language. And if you look at the web, the word web, was well known before Tim Berners-Lee, but it was meaning something else. It was a spider web. And browsing wasn't surfing the web, but it was going to the supermarket and buy some goods. So all of those words, they have been redefined. And that means if somebody introduces new words, and those words are picked up very quickly by other important people, and we know the importance of other people through their between the centrality and degree centrality, we will know their influence. And through the word um, uh, diversity, entropy, um, information content, we will know whether a community is creative and innovative or not. Either way, those are the three dimensions that we are measuring from face to face to email or WeChat, WhatsApp, and so on, um, to global Twitter, Facebook, Wikipedia networks, trying to find those people, the most effective, creative, collaborative people. 
that are communicating in those fully connected networks and trying to extract those seven honest signals, the between a and degree centrality, which I call central leadership, how much of a sender and a receiver of information you are, which I call balance contribution, whether you take turns in groups, that was one of the other things because we have done really hundreds of projects over the last 15 years analyzing archives on all three levels. And if in a group, the group changes between very centralized, decentralized, centralized, decentralized, goes back and forth, then it becomes more and more creative. And if it's different people that take the turns, it's even better. And those things you can measure if you have email. You can measure how quickly they respond, average response time. You can measure how emotional they are, not just positivity, but standard deviation of positivity. And that's actually better. For new ideas, you want emotionality, or what I call honest sentiment. And you want shared context, which is basically developing your own language and being spread in your own community. And then there is a new variable which we found very recently, which is sort of a social network metric, like closeness centrality. We call that reach two. It's how many people your friends know. If I know how many people Professor Tang knows, then I know your social influence. It's a very primitive variable. The good thing is it's very easy to calculate for very large networks. Very fast to calculate. So that's basically what our system now does. It provides an environment. We have built a tool called Condor that calculates those seven honest signals for all sorts of communication archives. From the happy meter to email to um, online scheduling systems, Skype to Twitter, Facebook, Wikipedia. And when I'm talking to corporate customers, and to individuals, they always tell me, but why we don't want to do this? This is too private. I'm so concerned about my own privacy. I don't want to share my system. And then I tell them, it's really like Google Maps. Because Google Maps, <coughs> on the one hand, we get the same thing. What we get is social maps. We don't get Google Maps, we get social maps. And Google Maps is very useful already if you have the general um, network and you see where you are and you know how you can go to some other place. But Google Map becomes even more useful if you know everybody else's location. Because then you know when there is a traffic jam. And I observed, and I know that for Boston, um, where I have been living there for 15 years, but um, it's still, to get from one point to another, there is about 20 different ways, and Google Maps tells me which is the fastest. Why? Because it knows where everybody else is. It doesn't care about individual people, but the aggregated information of where everybody is provides huge value. And if people are willing to share their social information, actually, it's just taken. If you tweet, it's there anyway, but you can get aggregated information also from other sources, just like with um, Google Maps. If you are using an Android phone, Google will know your location, and then it aggregates the information and it will tell you where the traffic jams are. And if you are in a company, you can take the aggregated information, then you know where the traffic jams are. Same thing. So this here is our system, it puts together the pieces. We have this social quantum physics loop. We have the seven honest signals that are being calculated. And then you see those views. This is individual information for the individual, just like Google Maps. Aggregated information for everybody, just like Google Maps. So you will only know where you are, and that's what we have shown to those people in the 70,000 people company. So they know how to change their behavior. And we have this tool called Condor, which you, if you go to the ICCAN website, 
There's an academic version you can download for free. There is also a commercial version that I have a little company which is marketing that to um, big companies and then you can calculate those social networks. This here is a network I can share very easily. It's extracted from my class which I'm teaching every term with students from Boston, from Cologne, from Chilean University sometimes. They're all collaborating and this is the social map. This is like Google Maps and you will know where people are. You will also know where the most influential people are. This to play somehow. Yes. So those green dots, that's the most influential person. And I'm delighted to see, say that's not me, that's a student. That's the student who was building the happy meter in the first project. He had some great ideas. This classroom is a great lab. It attracts very creative students. Then you see how in the beginning you saw my own dot. I was in the center. And then the students started to communicate among themselves. And they became unnecessary. That's what I want. And here is another tool we are building. It's called the Transparency Engine. And it addresses this very thorny concept of truth. Because truth is very personal. What is true for me is not true for you, it's not true for everybody has their own version of truth. And what we observe right now in the US, truth is extremely, it depends on your perspective. Donald Trump's truth and the truth of Hillary Clinton or the truth of somebody who is um, it's called a tree hugger, they are very different. So this is basically like a Google search engine, but for ideas and for people. And you can try it out if you go to transparencyengine.org. And you can also, and it only works with Twitter. You need to have a Twitter account. Then if you get to your tribe, this is the tribe of the Dalai Lama and also his own to what tribes does he belong. So we have created a simplified um, tribal system, but you can customize that to your own um, context depending on what you are analyzing. So we see that he's, it's basically, this is deep learning. We are using work to work and some other nice tools, and we train it with 10,000 known tribe members of the spiritual tribe, of a nerd tribe. If I would look at, I could show you my own, I would come up as a nerd and a bit of a tree hugger. Tree hugger is the people that are the, the green ones. And then you see the fatherlander, that would be Mr. Trump. The ones that think that their own nation is the greatest and the best. And then you would see who you really are. And what you can do that now with any concept that then you will get your own perspective of truth. So that is the tools that we have been building. And to wrap up my talk, I would like to come back to empathy and the way how we are working together and what motivates us to work together. And this is all about collaboration and competition. And if we look at our motivating factors, if you are in the capitalist world, it's basically capital, financial capital, money. But there is other things which are more important than financial capital, social capital, the willingness of doing favors. If we look at those different layers, you have the money layer where you have bankers. For me, that's the lowest level. And then you have other motivating factors, power like Donald Trump or Vladimir Putin. You have motivator getting famous, like George, an actor or an athlete. And what that builds is status. And that would then be somebody like Barack Obama or the Pope, who have a lot of status, but not necessarily money. But on the most highest level for me is the highest level uh, enlightenment, where you would have people like the Dalai Lama or Linus Torvalds, Jimmy Wales, Tim Berners-Lee, 
people that do things for the sake of doing them, without caring for personal gain. And the important thing here is that money can be really disruptive, and we have seen that with Hillary Clinton. Because she had high status, she starts giving talks for Goldman Sachs and so on, so you can basically move the layers by money, but this destroys your status. And so, in a sense, by cashing in too quickly, she destroyed her chances of becoming the US president. And that leads me to the last observation that when you have Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama and the Pope, you can either work together as competitors or as collaborators. And in the animal world, ants are the most successful species. Inside an ant hive, they will collaborate, but if one ant from one hive sees an ant from another hive, they will attack, and one will be eaten by the other one. I like the bees much better. Where one bee can even buy entry into another bee hive by bringing some honey. In, the, in our world, in the human world, the metaphor for collaborative competition is like soccer. Because in the team, you play together, and the team that plays together best will win, but you want to win. And that's very nice. But if you look at the soccer championship, and the one example was um, uh, in the one in Latin America, <coughs> where Germany was beating, that was this famous, uh, I think, 7-1, whatever. I can't remember anymore. But the entire Brazilian nation was totally destroyed for two, three, four years, because they lost that game. So that means you have winners, but you also have a lot of losers. Whereas if you have music, then you have only winners. Because the musicians, they will compete to some extent, but the main goal is to collaborate together with the audience. And I like that much better. If you'd like to know something more about those, I'm very happy to refer you to my two books, which came out very recently. One, Swarm Leadership, which describes this idea of empathy and entanglement. And the other one, which describes how we measure it, the sociometrics. OK, that's all I have to say. Thank you very much. Thank you, Peter. Peter gave a, a very good uh, a talk with uh, very rich, compact, and uh, multiple topics from heavy meters and to the, I, I suppose, to the or the meaning of the living, I suppose. So any questions and comments? Okay. Oh, yeah. I, actually, Sorry, I, I have a question. Yeah. 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 I have two very general questions. And the first is about, uh, about the, what do you predict the, the inference of artificial intelligence? So you talk about the, deep learning or something. And you also talk about the uh, collective intelligence of human beings. And uh, can you predict that uh, how much uh, the, the new development uh, of artificial, uh, uh, sorry, artificial intelligence like a deep learning, how could it uh, take effect to improve or, or, or maybe <laughs> the, the other effect for the, for the development of uh, Thank you, intelligence of human beings. This is my first general question. <laughs> yeah. uh, the second is about uh, in the last slides of your your presentation, maybe uh, about the collaboration and the company. Uh, yeah, that's it. And uh, you talk about a lot about the uh, empathy. Uh, and in in my opinion, the diversity is also uh, another important issue for the for collective intelligence, and uh, there must be some balance trade-off between. Uh, if we have to do something together, we need to some agreements. It's, yeah, and the empathy plays an important role for that. And, uh, but for when we need uh, uh, continuously <laughs> the credibility new, we also need uh, Say diversity of the personal ideas and the and the how to the measure that and uh, what what's the balance between the collaboration and the competitive. Thank you. 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 Thank
competition. And this, this is my second general question. Thank you very much. Those are both great general questions. Um, the first, and I'm very happy to address them because um, I just didn't have the time to go in more detail, or I didn't really want to make those wild predictions. But I think in the Q&A phase, that's perfectly fine. So I think that the way, and I just look at my own children and what they share, it would have been unimaginable just 10 or 15 years ago to do that. And so the interaction will become more and more intensive. And in fact, I think we will get there. There will just be a concert very soon in, um, at the MIT where people will wear brain helmets and it will read the brain waves. And then the music will be generated by the audience. To put it in other words, you have a totally intensive um, it's, it's the collective intelligence of the individual and of the individual and the collective becomes undistinguishable. So and will that change the way how we interact? Yes, it will. Absolutely. And uh, if you get an emperor like Mr. Trump, he would like to force his will to on everybody, then that would be the horror scenario. I'm an unfavorable optimist, so I hope we get the other option that as a group, we will be wise enough. And the decisions that we do as a group, and thanks to all the algorithms that right now this group is developing, because I mean what, just browsing through the proceedings before, all of the things that we are discussing here are building blocks for this sort of future that I have been describing here. So I very much hope, of course, that we get into that positive future where all of us will have empathy and not like your very first Chinese emperor who was killing everybody. Who, I mean, there's this saying that he was um, burning the books, that he was killing the, the scientists, the researchers, the wise people, and so on. That would be the horror scenario. But I don't think we'll get there. <laughs> so that's the first question. The second one, diversity. Yes, it, then is diversity needed? If it's too much diversity, and I think I can use my personal example. If we are so diverse, I'm from Switzerland, I speak Swiss German, you are from China, you speak Chinese, we can smile at each other, we can communicate by hand and feet, but we can only talk because both of us learn, you speak Chinese English, I speak Swiss English. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So you need something that, that mediates the diversity. There is some experiments about um, student teams done by a colleague of mine, and he found that if you have students from different cultures, the results are not as good than if you have students from the same cultures that have many friends from different cultures. <laughs> so you get some diverse input. Okay. So thanks. Uh, any any answers? Uh, if no more questions, because time is also uh, close, uh, is enough. So let's thank Peter again for his talk. Thank you very much. Uh, next time.